So, uh, good afternoon, Your Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, you're welcome to the IEA for our series of, of lectures and, and, and discussions. Um, and we're delighted uh, to, to welcome uh, to the IIEA today uh, Gert Jan Kopman, who is uh, Director General of DG Budget uh, in, 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 in Brussels. Um, uh, we, we had an opportunity of talking over lunch, and he's uh, someone within the Commission system who has extensive uh, experience, uh, and especially so given his role uh, for the MMF negotiations, uh, which of course are so important for 2021 to 2027. Uh, three observations on that. Firstly, uh, I was there the last time in 2013, uh, when Ireland had the presidency, I was in the Irish government at the time, and uh, I know the very intensive round of negotiations and the role of the presidency in trying to strike a deal. I think it was Tony Blair who once said that uh, coming to an agreement on the EU budget, or the MMF as we know it, is a bit like uh, Europe coming close to World War III, uh, <laughs> such as the uh, very, very difficult task in hand. But it's especially so given the huge challenges that Europe faces right now uh, that we get this right. And, uh, Gert Jan, your, your role and that of your colleagues within the Commission will be so important given the new leadership positions as we have seen in the last uh, uh, 20, 24 hours. Uh, one other observation to make, I mean the EU budget is, it has a, is a radically altered and changed instrument for Ireland as a net beneficiary for so many years we are now a net contributor and that will of course uh, change somewhat the political discussion and narrative in the, in the coming years, but it's of course it's still a very important instrument for agriculture uh, in this country and for other areas, uh, poorer parts of the country would still need investment uh, from the European Union. So that debate will also be interesting. So uh, it's great pleasure to welcome you. I should remind people that uh, the speech is is on the record, but the questions and discussions thereafter are uh, very much on the principle of Chatham House rules. And uh, it's, it's my great pleasure to ask uh, Gert Jan now to address us at the IEA, and then we'll have questions thereafter. Gert Jan. Thank you, Thank you very much, very much uh, Brian. Pleasure to be here. Um, so it's a real pleasure to be here, and, and to be back here, I should actually say, because I remember talking uh, in this uh, uh, wonderful uh, uh, hall about uh, the uh, fallout of the financial uh, crisis uh, uh, in, in much darker days than, uh, than today, uh, looking at uh, the state of uh, the banking uh, uh, union. So what, what I thought I should do uh, is to run you through um, a little presentation uh, of uh, the proposals which the Commission has made on the multiannual financial framework to talk a little bit about the uh, underlying ideas and uh, the um, uh, process and, and speculate a little bit about uh, uh, where we uh, are likely uh, to land. Um, I'll try to speak for about 25 minutes so that we have plenty of time for, for discussion afterwards. Already begin with the, the introduction. Um, now, first point to make, the multi-annual financial framework is effectively a seven-year framework for a budget which is an investment budget. And it's a small budget compared to national budgets. As you know, national budgets are in the order of 40%, between 35 and 50% of GNI. The EU's budget is just slightly above 1% of GNI, so it's a much smaller animal. But it focuses on, uh, on, on things that can only be done at the European level. So it, it has European value added and uh, it, uh, 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 helps uh, uh, to achieve objectives that member states uh, acting on their own uh, cannot uh, achieve. So within that seven-year framework, once it's set, uh, once World War III is over, then uh, we have uh, smaller skirmishes on the annual budget, but this annual budget takes place within the frameworks uh, uh, of the, within the framework of the uh, MFF. Um, now, I think that uh, this MFF uh, proposal, which was adopted uh, in May and June of last year, is uh, um, radically different from, from what we have today in, in several respects. Um, and I'm not just talking about the fact that the UK is exiting and the UK is uh, a significant net uh, contributor, as you know, 
but it's also a budget that focuses on challenges uh, that are uh, new and which we have seen over the past years in the EU require a response that is financed at the European level. Um, and I'll come back to that uh, when I walk you through some of the proposals. It also contains uh, a new mechanism to protect uh, the EU budget from generalized deficiencies in the rule of law. Uh, as you know, about 80% of the budget is executed by member states or with member states, and therefore they're responsible for making sure that in case there are difficulties, uh, uh, funds can be uh, returned. Uh, if uh, the rule of law doesn't function properly, then uh, this uh, uh, guarantee no longer exists, and therefore we need to have remedies in place to address this. Um, so that's a, a second important uh, feature. Um, what I would say is also strongly emphasized in this budget is what, I, what we call with a horrible word, performance. In other words, we want to be sure that the funds actually deliver, that the programs deliver the objectives, and we measure that and that we adjust. There's been simplification, a lot of red tape has been removed, for example, in the area of agriculture, where there's been great simplification. Um, and we've also tried to make the budget more flexible to make sure that over a long period, seven years, we can reallocate uh, uh, resources to areas where, where, where new priorities uh, emerge. Seven years is very long uh, by national standards, as you know, so we need to have adequate flexibility in the budget. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about the numbers, <laughs> because I think it's important. Um, as I said before, um, the um, budget is not big. And the Commission's proposal, as you can see at, on the right hand of this slide, is for a budget of 1.11% or 1.114% of GNI, including the European Development Fund, which at the moment is an off-budget uh, intergovernmental uh, uh, instrument that is worth about 0.03% of GNI. And that compares, if you look at expenditure in the 27 member states, so excluding uh, uh, the UK, uh, under the present uh, MFF, compares with 1.16%, so 1.13 in the budget and 0.03 for the EDF, 1.16%. So there's actually a cut in the budget uh, uh, as a proportion of uh, 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 GNI, reflecting the fact that the Commission has decided to uh, deal with the consequences of Brexit by effectively cutting uh, uh, the budget to the tune of 50% of these consequences and asking for higher contributions from Member States uh, for the remainder. And I would also say 1.11%, uh, if you go back a little bit in time uh, uh, to the uh, early 90s and even the early 2000s, you will see that it's actually a budget that remains relatively modest uh, compared to what we have seen in Europe uh, before. Now, I've talked about new priorities, and if you bear with me, let me maybe uh, uh, talk you through this graph, which I think is very important, which represents the composition of the budget at a very high level of aggregation. So the top line here represents uh, the uh, common agricultural policies and fisheries policy, and uh, what you see here are the shares of this policy in, uh, um, uh, in the total budget. Similarly, the second line, uh, the green line, represents cohesion, including uh, the social funds. Um, the third line represents uh, all the other programs, which you see listed on the right-hand side, and which are essentially addressing uh, uh, future priorities, new priorities, uh, but also uh, uh, policies that uh, are aimed at generating higher productivity, which in an aging Europe we definitely need. The bottom line represents uh, uh, the administrative costs, which stand at 6.4% of GNI. Important to note, sometimes people think that all of this money goes to uh, administration, but actually it's quite small. And what you see here over time is that um, these shares have evolved significantly. Over the past uh, uh, three uh, decades, uh, the share of agriculture uh, has been on a, on a downward trend from above 60%. Um, and that's essentially because normally these budgets have been frozen at nominal level and inflation has been eating away at the support. Cohesion increased significantly uh, to reflect enlargements, uh, um, and then it has been flat, uh, and now it is on a slightly uh, decreasing uh, uh, trend. 
And as you see, what, make, what sets this budget apart from all the other budgets is that the future-oriented policy, so to speak, would for the first time represent the lion's share of the budget. So in that sense, there is a significant shift. It's not a huge budget, but it is a budget that is significantly being uh, adjusted. Um, to express it a little bit differently, we can talk about uh, uh, the total amount, which, which stands at uh, approximately uh, 1,280 billion euros over the seven years. And it is broken down in headings, which are like budget chapters, if you will. So um, the single market innovation, innovation and digital sectors represent uh, just less than uh, 200 billion euros. Uh, and that comprises not just the enormously successful Horizon program, but also a new program on space, where Europe uh, is uh, not just a standard setter, but is actually uh, responsible for uh, putting uh, the basic infrastructure up that uh, ensures that we have autonomy and we're not completely reliant on uh, the US or, or the Russians. Second uh, uh, heading, uh, cohesion and values, of course comprises uh, the, the structural and investment funds and is uh, worth about 440 billion euros. The uh, third um, heading uh, comprises the cap, uh, including the fisheries policy, uh, but also the small life program and is worth uh, uh, about 380 billion euros. Security and defense, very new area, very small area also in budgetary terms, uh, 28 billion euros. A radically new external instrument called uh, uh, NDC. I'm sorry for this horrible abbreviation, but it stands for an instrument that integrates both the EDF and our neighborhood policy, um, which uh, uh, would be worth uh, uh, about 123 billion euros. And then, as I said, there is a uh, uh, European public administration at about 85 billion euros. So that's the breakdown. Now, I'll walk you through some of the uh, more uh, significant uh, changes, which you saw reflected uh, at a high level of aggregation in a previous slide, to see how these different policies have evolved. And um, what you see here is that the Commission has chosen to really prioritize uh, research, innovation, and digital. Um, and uh, the increase here is about 60%. Our youth programs, mostly Erasmus, but also the, volunteer, the, the volunteering corps, solidarity corps, have been increased by about 120%. Climate and environment by 70%. Migration by 160% from a very low basis. Obviously, uh, these are percentage increases security by 80%, and our external action uh, by about 30%. So this represents about 109 billion euros of increases in areas where over the past years we have seen that we've been struggling in every annual budget uh, discussion to find the means to deal with the fallout of the Turkey crisis, for example, where we've had to set up uh, very innovative, uh, to use a polite word, structures such as a trust fund partly financed by the member states, partly financed by the budget, reprogramming -pro uh, the whole budget, trying to cut uh, 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 areas that were uh, 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 offering possibilities to do so in order to, to finance something. And we've, we've found it very difficult in reality to, to, to achieve this. Uh, this is not a way to deal with uh, geopolitical uh, uh, challenges. We need to be able to address these in a much more uh, robust manner, and that's why you see these increases in these areas. Another feature that is important is that the Commission sees 25% of this budget going to measures that have a demonstrably positive impact uh, on the fight against climate change. Um, and because the budget is a bit bigger, uh, and at the moment we're aiming at 20%, that represents uh, a significant increase uh, of about 100 billion euros going to the fight against climate change. And this is real conditionality. This is not just greenwashing. So you know, there, this will have to be measured and monitored on an annual basis and discussed with the budgetary authority, parliament, and council as we move forward. Now, I want to spend a little bit of time on some of the uh, uh, priority areas because I think it will give you a flavor of why these increases are so important. And, uh, the first is the Horizon uh, uh, Europe program, which I, as I've said, this, this heading increases by about 60%. And we think it is absolutely fundamental because ultimately with demogra demography flat 
and aging becoming a real phenomenon going forward, you know, we will simply not be able to sustain the European way of life if we do not have higher productivity growth in Europe. And this means that we will need to ensure uh, that research and development and innovation are boosted. Uh, this is being achieved through a program that actually is vastly successful. And I don't want to sound arrogant, but the evaluations, independent evaluations done of the Horizon program are really very interesting uh, food for thought uh, because they show that if we design programs that really emphasize excellence, that focus on getting the best minds together across uh, uh, the 28 member states and providing support uh, for the best ideas selected not by us, the bureaucrats, but by the researchers themselves, we can have very meaningful impacts. Um, one concrete instance, the European Research Council has been an unmitigated success. We were losing in the international race for talent and for scientific excellence. Uh, our first position, which you know, we've had for a long time on account of the fact that you know, Europe is where science was invented. Um, so we were losing it to the, to the US. But the European Research Council, because it was so much focused on excellence, giving small grants to scientific uh, excellence, uh, so to, to scientists who, who produce new ideas, published in uh, refereed uh, journals, A-class refereed journals, uh, these funds have succeeded in regaining this first position. And with that, we've seen very interesting developments. We, we don't want to talk about too much, maybe, in some, in some quarters, but which we should be proud of. We see researchers from the US and from China actually working in European universities funded by the European Research uh, uh, Council. So you know, this actually works. It delivers tangible evidence of scientific excellence. So that's one important part. The other important part is that we are addressing through um, the European Innovation Council um, the next big step, which is to ensure that this research, which is excellent, as I've just said, actually translates better into uh, innovation, something Europe is not so good at, as we know. Now, a research program, public subsidies are only a small part of the puzzle there. Um, deep capital markets, venture capital, uh, a single market uh, for uh, 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 our uh, banking union is very, very important. But, but funds help. Uh, if, if we don't have venture capital to the tune of what is available in the US, then maybe we need to ensure that there is a little bit of seed money available from public uh, uh, coffers. So the European Innovation Council is actually, to put it in very simple terms, aiming at replicating the success of the European Research Council in research in the area of, uh, of, of, of innovation. So these um, increases in the budget are backed up by very solid evidence of European value added. These are things which arguably member states cannot achieve to a similar level of uh, 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 excellence by acting alone. If you organize competition amongst 27 member states, you're likely to get better ideas coming out than if you organize 27 competitions. Um, and what is notable, of course, in this respect is that the distribution of these funds in terms of where they go doesn't follow a juste retour logic, doesn't follow the logic of, you know, everyone gets more or less what he or she pays in. No, it is very skewed. Um, and that, of course, is triggering a political debate of its own. Uh, and we have to ensure that countries that are lagging behind a lot, notably in Eastern Europe, catch up. But that cannot be done at the expense of the principle of excellence that requires funding in their basic research infrastructure for which the cohesion funds are necessary. So this is a very important one. Um, now, I will say uh, a word about another important evolution that has just led to a result, which is a budget for uh, the uh, euro area. At least, I should be a bit more modest, an instrument for convergence and competitiveness uh, for the euro area that will be introduced uh, in the budget as uh, a tool aimed at effectively fostering greater convergence in economic structures in the euro area by financing on concessionary terms and against strong conditionality um, investments and reforms that will make the uh, uh, economic infrastructure of euro area member states more resilient and more robust when faced with shocks. 
This is not a fully-fledged euro area budget. It is a small instrument. This is not a stabilization tool that allows to balance out economic shocks, so I'm not pretending it's more than it is. But it is a very important first step because it's the first time that the euro area as such is equipped with a budgetary tool that uh, is integrated in the EU budget and that um, provides co-financing for such reforms on the basis of guidance set by the euro area, so by the euro group, therefore. So the principle here is, is super important. Um, and ultimately, it goes back to the very fundamental issue of ensuring that uh, the euro area can function effectively uh, with a degree of uh, um, economic governance underpinning it as well, uh, not just uh, monetary uh, integration. So this has been decided in principle uh, uh, at the European Council last month, and now it will need to be finalized as part of the MFF uh, going forward. I've already talked a little bit about the rule of law, um, which aims at sound financial management, uh, at ensuring that uh, the budget is uh, protected. I won't go into too much detail. There's a lot of detail on the slide. The slides will be available for you. But in effect, what it means is that member states who, after having been invited to rectify deficiencies, are not doing this, will see funds being uh, uh, suspended and ultimately uh, withdrawn. Um, this is a very important proposal for the reason that I've mentioned, um, and it is making uh, uh, good progress in the negotiations uh, in the Council. Now, I also think we should say a word about the revenue side of the budget. I've talked a bit about the expenditure side of the budget. The revenue side of the budget is important. Um, it um, largely consists of contributions on the basis of a GNI key, um, but there are also traditional own resources, customs duties, uh, and there's a contribution based on, uh, on VAT. Commission has uh, proposed to uh, extend this, um, also by bringing in some fresh revenues. Uh, I will not say too much about the CCCTB, the Common Consolidated Corporate Tax Base, because it has pretty much been uh, discarded uh, in the negotiations, but there is still a debate about the revenues from emission trading, which uh, uh, are likely are set to increase over time, um, where there is still an ongoing debate. There is a contribution from member states uh, based on the percentage of non-recycled plastics. This is an environmental uh, levy, if you will, which, which seems to have gained uh, broad support. And then there's an interest in uh, uh, new own resources. Um, and this is understandable because you will, not, you will see that national contributions obviously will have to go up. We have proposed some savings. On the other hand, uh, uh, there will also be a, a higher share uh, of uh, uh, member states' uh, contributions required, uh, given that uh, uh, the Brexit gap uh, uh, is, uh, is what it is. Now, we believe that rebates uh, actually uh, are to be phased out because the logic of the net contributor thinking in a budget that is becoming modernized is, is increasingly more difficult to sustain, but equally we cannot have uh, member states uh, subject to enormous shocks, so this has to be done gradually. And finally, the own resources ceiling, this is a little bit technical, which is the maximum amount that can be drawn uh, from the budget, is proposed uh, to increase uh, to 1.29% of GNI. I will not go into too much detail, but this is important for a lot of the lending operations uh, uh, which the Union engages in, for example, under the Juncker plan. What is the state of play of the negotiations? Well, the Parliament uh, clearly feels that the Commission has been too modest and has asked uh, for the budget to be increased uh, to 1.3% uh, of GNI, which, roughly speaking, means another 200 billion euros. This has not met with... Uh, great enthusiasm in the, in the Council, but the logic the Parliament followed was to say just put cap and cohesion back to where it was uh, in the previous, uh, or in the, in the current MFF, and reinforce all the other programs significantly more than you have done. And uh, obviously you also need uh, the own resources to be part of the package. The European Council uh, in June of this year um, uh, uh, decided that it would revert to this issue in depth in October with a view to reaching an agreement before the end of the year. And that is actually an important step in the negotiation process, where up until now the European Council has not uh, uh, taken such a strong uh, view. 
I've talked a lot about the budgetary framework, um, but obviously the budgetary framework only works if the underlying programs are actually adopted. These are the workhorses of the budget, and they were all proposed alongside the Commission's uh, uh, budgetary proposals in May of last year, May, June of last year, and they've made good progress, but there's still a lot of work still to be done. So uh, in red, you will see the area where the least progress has been uh, achieved, which unfortunately is the common agricultural policy. Uh, in green, you see the programs where a partial agreement has been reached. Um, and in yellow, you see the many proposals where effectively the council on the one hand and the parliament on the other hand have advanced, but uh, 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 have not yet engaged in trilogues with a view to reaching an agreement. And those are the key programs you see listed in the right hand, uh, in the bottom right hand uh, corner. Um, so still a lot of work to be able to actually spend the money. And um, against that background, uh, it might be worth just looking at the amount of time that is needed between uh, reaching an agreement in the European Council on the Budgetary Framework and actually being able to spend the money under the programs uh, and, and ensuring that the own resources are available. Here we have mapped, I, I'm not sure you can actually read this in detail, but we've mapped what happened last time round, where in uh, February 2013 an agreement was reached in the European Council, that's the top line. And then obviously there was a negotiation uh, with the European Parliament who, had to give, uh, who has to give consent, which uh, uh, was reached uh, uh, effectively uh, only in June, um, leading to uh, a, a formal consent in November. Uh, uh, so, so that took another essentially uh, uh, eight months. Uh, and then, you know, the Council had to adopt the multi-annual financial framework regulation. The sectoral proposals, the ones you just saw, sh saw in, the, in the previous slide, were, were also not finalized at the time. So negotiations continued right until April 2014, so four months into the existing, uh, the current MFF. And uh, the own resources uh, decision was uh, uh, only uh, adopted uh, uh, in uh, uh, May of that year. So what we're saying here is that uh, um, an agreement in December of this year is actually already on the very late side and we have a collective interest to ensure that this budget is then effectively agreed at the level of the European Council because otherwise we will simply not be able to start in 2021 and with all the geo geopolitical challenges, the challenges of Brexit, this would not be a, a good outcome. As you see here, very practically, very graphically, this delay in 2014 led to a collapse in commitments uh, in 2014. Um, and, and that is precisely what we, we do, not, do not want uh, to replicate uh, this year uh, round. So what is the timeline as we see it uh, today? Um, we um, start from the European Council of June, where the Euro Area Budget Instrument in terms of the big decisions was, was agreed. We have the first uh, rendezvous in October of this year, and we then hope that the European Council in November and December of this year, as per their commitment, would seek uh, uh, an agreement on the package. We would then have negotiations between the Council and the EP until EP consent. Um, and then uh, the uh, uh, MFF regulation the spending programs, and obviously the annual budget 2021, which is still necessary to be able to spend money in 2021, would be adopted in the course of next year. So this simply illustrates the different steps that need to be taken and illustrates also how ambitious this line is. It's clear that with Brexit playing in the background, uh, the European Council will be busy. Um, but it's also clear that equipping ourselves with a budgetary framework is actually a crucial part of the response to Brexit so that we are capable of delivering the policies that are needed to deal with the fallout of whatever form of Brexit we'll be faced with. Naturally, as we know, uh, also in light of the decisions taken yesterday, uh, the appointments for the next institutional cycle play out uh, this autumn and will therefore also imply uh, uh, a very careful uh, uh, management, uh, a need for very careful management to ensure that this timeline can be uh, maintained. That's where we are. There's a lot of information, a lot more uh, uh, substance available on this uh, particular uh, website, but obviously I'm very happy to take any questions or comments you may have at this juncture. Thank you very much.